amen, amen. I am just so excited to be here. I am so excited to be here. Amen. This is, uh, I believe, three Sundays in a row that we've seen Sister Melissa. Be careful. That's how you become part of the family. The weird, weird family. (laughs) Amen. Amen. So good to see you today. I am just glad to be in the house of the Lord. Anybody excited? Like, mm. you know, excited like, woo! Excited. Excited. Amen. I, I was, I've been excited and excited and more excited and more excited. And then dad started teaching and went right to my text. I was a little less excited when he did that. I was like, come on. Psalms 1 is mine today. Out of all the scriptures, Psalms 1 is mine. Evidently, I am keeping track of what we've been doing in Sunday school because in the, it's probably this whole year, there's been more times than not <laughs> that it's right alongside the, what, what we're teaching in Sunday school in our, our adult class. So... Amen. But I would like to to preach just for the next little bit today. That's your cue to start my timer. Thank you. Y'all don't get to turn around and look. That's for me. Come on. (laughs) Anytime somebody turns around, just reset it. Well, I'm just kidding. That's what's up. Uh, I could do it. Maybe. But if you have your Bibles, if you would turn with me to Psalm chapter number one. Psalm chapter number one. We're going to go ahead and read verses one and two. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Verse 2, why don't you all go ahead and read that together. Amen. Amen. If you would, go ahead. You can, as you're, actually turn to somebody and just shake their hand or give them the high five. And then y'all may be seated. And while y'all are seated, go ahead and turn to Judges chapter 6. I'm going to go ahead and read all my verses here at the beginning. And then uh, I'll just, that'll, that'll alleviate some time. <laughs> Sorry. I almost said that with a straight face. Judges chapter number 6, verse 12 says this. And we're, we're kind of coming in. After the angel has already come and met Gideon. If you don't know who Gideon is, he, Gideon, he's the one that never died ever. And he still goes around to hotels and puts Bibles in drawers with nobody looking. You know this Bible that says placed by the Gideons? It's actually him. No, it's not. That is not true. Gideon died. <laughs> but we, we, we come into this story as the angel is fixing to rock Gideon's world. Gideon was shy. Uh, Evidently, he had an attitude. But with his attitude, he lacked any decisiveness to act. So the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Don't you love slash hate, slash love, when somebody can see something in you better than you can? You kind of love it, yet hate it, yet love it. One of the worst words in the world, yet one of the greatest, is potential. And I, I almost hate using that word because 
It's like I see such potential. And, and, uh, and, and if your spirit is right, you say, what, what do you see? Whether it's, whether it's a, 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 a JB as an electrician. JB, what do you see? Man, you got potential. Whether it's, it's, it's as, a, as a friend, as a peer, man, you got such potential. Jonathan, what do you see? Pastor, what do you see? You have potential. And then sometimes, if you're a little askew, you have such potential. You're telling me I'm not enough. You're telling me I'm not doing good enough. You're telling me that I'm not being good enough or I'm not being enough. You're telling me that there is a great disparity between who I am and who I'm supposed to be. Thanks. I love that word, yet hate it. Oh, oh, the Lord is with thee, thou mighty man of valor. Uh Uh-uh. No. Verse number 25, we're going to skip down to 25. And it came to pass the same night that the Lord said unto him, Take thy father's young bullock, even the second bullock of seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that thy father hath, and cut down the grove that is by it. And so on and so forth, and such and such did he. He did it. But he was given the potential talk. This is what I see. You're better than, your, than, 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 than where you're living. You're, you're better than this. You're smarter than this. And whenever I got that talk, because I got that talk a lot, I was usually in trouble. Come on. You are better than this. Have you ever stopped to think that maybe I'm not better than this? Have you ever stopped to think that all this potential you say I have Actually, I do belong in the principal's office getting whooped a lot. That I, This is where I learn. Because evidently the classroom is not where it's at. You have such potential. Have you ever stopped to consider that maybe I'm not what you think I am? This is what Gideon's plight was. This was his mindset, and you can see his mindset because he says, okay, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. If what you're telling me is true, I'm not going to doubt, totally doubting. I'm going to put a fleece out, and I want tomorrow morning this fleece. I'm going to put it out on the ground, and I want this fleece Miraculously, I want the ground to be full of dew, but when I pick up this fleece, it's going to be dry. So Gideon said, it's not on me, and he went to bed, went to sleep, woke up the next morning, walks out getting his sandals wet and dew between his toes, and he picks up the fleece and he goes, Okay, this is impossible. Okay, 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 okay. One more time. Okay, 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 okay. I want this wet and no dew anywhere around it. I want all the land to be dry. He needed this, so he woke up the next morning and he picked up this sopping wet, dripping fleece. I believe this is where we get the term fleecing the Lord. See how somebody, the Lord is with thee and thou art a mighty man of valor. He even can come up with things that stick around for thousands of years. Fleecing the Lord. Gideon, did you know you get credit for that? Here you are thinking you're nothing, but you get credit for saying something that is still said today thousands of years later in the church. Well, I just don't know if go ahead and fleece the Lord. I don't know what that means. Let me tell you about Gideon. I, I think Gideon's story is, is kind of like what, what, what uh, secularism, what the secular world, and I don't mean sinful, because you and I say it. 
<clears throat> Have I ever told you about the little engine that could? <laughs> Have I ever told you about the story of Gideon? How Gideon didn't think he was anything, yet God used him mightily? Have I ever told you the story about Gideon? The angel of the Lord peered unto him and said, The Lord is with you. You are a mighty man of valor. I, yeah, I, can't, I, can't, I can't believe that. But he ended up believing it because he was bold enough to ask for proof. Now we're going to go down to Matthew chapter 14, verses 25 to 29. And in the fourth watch of the night... Jesus went unto them, walking on the sea. And when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were troubled, saying, It is a spirit. It's a ghost. It's a ghost. It's a spirit. And they cried out for fear. Come on, these are grown men. Grown men. One night without Jesus. Several of these men are fishermen who have undoubtedly spent the night on the open sea, Lake of Galilee. Don't look now, but I think it's a ghost. But straightway Jesus spake unto them. Can you imagine the sense of humor? Can you imagine? I I believe, I personally believe that that God Almighty, that Jesus has a sense of humor. I believe that. Can you imagine (laughs) what was going on in his mind? And he was like, I should just go right up to them. And then he was like, no, no, I'm. I'm going to walk like by them close enough for them to see and be like, oh, hey, I didn't see you there. <laughs> That's the way my mind works. Now, God, if, if I'm totally off base and you're not ornery like I think, I'm sorry. I apologize. But I kind of think that God might be a little ornery. The way he talks to me usually is with a lot of orneriness and sarcasm. That's kind of what I understand, though. So. <laughs> he spake unto them, saying, Be of good cheer. I am scared to death. Hey, don't worry, be happy. <laughs> it is I, be not afraid. Oh, whew. thanks, Jesus. And Peter answered him and said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come unto thee on the water. And he said, come. That's all he said. Now, when cooler heads prevail, and Jesus said, come, I might have stopped for a second and said, did he say, um, or come? Because I don't want to get this wrong. (laughs) He tell me, um, or don't suck your thumb. I got to get this one right. But no, cooler heads did not prevail. Peter steps out of the boat. When Peter was come down out of the boat, he walked on the water to go to Jesus. Now, I am going to use a few sayings and a few anecdotes today. And here's the first one. Um, There's an erroneous claim that Confucius said this many years ago. But it was actually someone named uh, Lao Tzu. And he said, they made this statement. The journey of a thousand miles begins with a single step. I believe that Peter... now. You have to understand that in Peter's call was Peter's fall. God knew. Jesus Christ knew. When he called him, come, I will make you a fisher of men. He knew when he looked at Peter. He knew but long before Andrew even brought Peter to him. 
He knew that Peter was going to fall. He knew Peter was going to deny him. He knew it. He knew everything about Peter. So long before Jesus looked at Peter and said, follow me and I'll make you a fisher of men. Long before he made that call to Peter's life, he already saw Peter's fall. He already saw him preaching the message on the day of Pentecost. He already saw first and second Peter. He already saw it. He already saw every story or every joke about heaven, people seeing St. Peter at the door. He, he already saw every joke, already saw everything about Peter. Long before. But I believe that there is something miraculous. And I believe that there is something that is so powerful that this night... Of all nights, when I guarantee you Peter was at the center of being scared out of his mind that there was a ghost coming to gobble them up on a sea that he should know. That that step began a journey of faith in his life. Because the journey of a thousand miles always begins with one single step. From Gideon starting his journey of finally, maybe not totally believing it with all his heart, but not willing to say, no, angel, you're wrong, because he fleeced the Lord. To that night, taking ten servants, taking ten servants and going and knocking down the grove where they would worship Baal at an altar. To Peter getting out of the boat that night, I believe that we have every right to dissect both of these events, we have the right to dissect the reasons. And I know that, that, that some of this, we can, we can see so much, and then so much we're going to have to extrapolate what the situations could have been. I, Brother Trent and I, years ago, we were talking about all the selfies on, on Facebook. And he posted something about the way he thought about something. And, and so <laughs> we had that conversation, if you remember, about selfies. And he says, well, at least I'm not putting selfies. And I was like, oh, actually, you are. He goes, oh, there's not one selfie. I was like, what you posted, what we're talking about, that is called a psychological selfie. <sighs> Maybe I'm wrong, but this is my opinion. Oh, no, your opinion is beautiful. I feel so ugly today. That's because you are ugly today. Just be honest. Stop posting pictures. I'm sorry. Did I say that aloud? I'm just I'm just being serious. <laughs> I can't really say I'm sorry because I'm ornery and kind of a smart aleck. He fl Gideon fleeced the Lord. And by saying so, he told God, I hear the words that you're saying, but I'm going to need some proof. Now, now, why did Gideon say that? Because Gideon knew who God was by story. He knew who God was by tradition. He knew who he was by law. But he did not know God by experience. I'm, I'm going to leave that there for a second. And I want you to look back in your life and go ahead and apply that to areas that it needs to be applied to. Sometimes we seek proof 
for the things that are said to us or the things that God shows us about ourselves or about our families or about our future, about our call, about our destiny, about our purpose. We want God to prove it. Why? Because sometimes we lack the personal experience. Oh, yeah, we show up at church and we, woo, mm, 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 we feel it. Sometimes we can even get hyped where the blood starts going. And, you know, I don't know if you've ever seen that terrible, terrible cartoon called Home. But the music comes on and all of a sudden his, what are you doing to me? And he holds it down and then his other leg starts going. And he holds that down. And sometimes that's, we, we kind of get that. You know, we start turning colors and doing that in church. You're like, man, I feel it now. Come on. Mm -mm. I mean, just the, the, the shout music there before, sir, I'm ready. Ready. It's pumping me up, man. Getting that. Just, woo, yeah. If I'd have been less spiritual, I'd have done the wave. But you don't need to see that. But see, Gideon fleeced the Lord because he needed proof. Peter stepped out of the boat. All Peter needed was an invitation. Why? Because Peter didn't just know Jesus. He didn't, just didn't know God because of tradition and because of stories and because of the law. He had now met and walked with God some in his life. Peter had an experience with Jesus. And when he said, Lord, if it be thou, bid me come. And I believe that what Peter also knew was not just the voice of the Lord, but he also recognized through his experience what it was to be called by Jesus. To be called by Jesus. Come, follow me, and I'll make you fisher of men. He understood what the call of God did to him. And I believe that this is why he went ahead and got out of the boat. Got down out of the boat. Is because he knew what the call of God did to him. And so, if it be thou, bid me come. And he said, come. And he got down out of the boat to go to Jesus. He walked on the water. He walked on the water. He may not have been a smart man. And y'all know the voice that I really want to do that in right now. No? He might not be a smart man. But he seemed to be someone who had an understanding of how things work. He seemed to be a man who, who recognized a few things. Now maybe he didn't have a degree from Harvard or a degree from MIT, but he probably understood the physics enough and he probably knew the law of gravity enough to know that if I get out of a boat, I'm going down. What he was witnessing by Jesus walking on the water was completely contrary to everything he knew to be true. You know, that's probably one of the hardest things about being a true Christian. And I know everybody talks about, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian, I'm a Christian. I received, I believe, I this, I that. I give money to so-and-so. I'm a true Christian. But we, we won't allow our belief to be questioned or scrutinized even by ourselves. I can't question this. That would be a lack of faith. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You have to understand what it is you read. You, you have to be able to understand. And sometimes you just can't do that by yourself. I'm reminded of a story. A man of God in the book of Acts was having a great grand old time. And then all of a sudden, poof, he's standing in a desert. And there's an Ethiopian going by on a chariot 
reading out of the prophets. And he said, I'm going to say it in KJV. Understandest thou what thou readest? Do you understand what you're reading? And the man said this. He's like, well, I'm reading it, but uh, how am I supposed to be able to understand it if there's not a man to explain it to me? He said, hold on a second. And he explained it to him. And then in the middle of a desert, miraculously, there's a pool of water. And the Ethiopian looks at him and he says, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Hey, that's a good idea. Why don't we do that right here, right now? And when he came up out of the water, guess what? The man of God was, he was whisked away again. Scotty wasn't even needed. But he was beamed to the desert. And then he was beamed back. Gene Roddenberry has nothing on Jesus. I'm a little bit of a trick. But I'm big time a Jesus guy. I'm big time a Jesus guy. What Peter did was he allowed the witnessed power of God that had apparently just broken the laws of physics and gravity. Peter allowed this. He allowed his witness to change the very structure of what he knew to be true. Do you know that there's some times that we come into the house of God, we don't understand what's going on in our lives, we don't understand what's going on in our family's life. And we never know what's going on in our wives' minds, or we wouldn't be in trouble. Amen, husbands? Thank you for all the one of you that has the guts to say amen. <laughs> Babe, I sure wish my men were the men, your women are women. I'm picking, I'm picking. I know, you don't want to get in trouble. I'll probably forgive you quicker than she does. I really need to stop. I need to stop. I apologize. I don't know if I can tell you. He allowed the witness power of God to change the way that he understood the world. To, to change the way that he understood Jesus and to change the way that he understood the miraculous and the power of God. Okay, Jesus, if you're supposed to be my example and you're walking on water, then why can't I? So if you call me, I'll walk to you. Come. Come. And he got out of the boat, down out of the boat, and he walked across the water. And when he perceived the waves boisterous, when he took his eyes off of Jesus, and he started looking around him, I'm going to pastor for a second here. You want to know why you feel like you're drowning? Because you've taken your eyes off of Jesus and you've started contemplating the world around you and you've started contemplating your own life, your own faults, your own failures, maybe your own calling. Maybe you have drank the Kool-Aid. I'm sorry, that's such a bad joke to say. That was not a Jim Jones reference, I promise. The Kool-Aid of egotism. When everybody else thinks you're wonderful and you start to believe it, I am. I'm that good. Oh, yeah. Praise and worship my holy name. You have taken your eyes off of Jesus, and that's why you begin to sink. Why? As Leon Patillo years ago, he said, Peter steps out of the boat and starts walking, and then he starts looking around, and he goes, I can't walk on water. Blah, 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 blah. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let not that man think he will receive anything of the Lord. You cannot have a double mind. You keep your eyes upon Jesus. You want to learn to break the
the laws of physics and the laws of gravity? I wonder this. This is a true wondering of me. I wonder if Peter, for the rest of his life, when you, I wonder if he ever just would start walking into the water. And he would go, all right, how's my faith today? All right, God, I still got some work to do. Still got some work to do. I got wet up to the knees. All right, God, I have total faith in you. My eyes are on, up to my knees again. What is in the world is going on? How about if I write 1 Peter? Let's see how that goes. Oh, hey, made it far, up to the ankles. Okay, I'm going to try to write 2 Peter and try to increase other people's faith. I'm gonna, I wonder that. I wonder if, if Peter, for the rest of his life, kept, every time he would cross, like, he would come by, he would look and say, yeah, I don't see anybody. <laughs> my, my mind sees Peter doing that. Brother Tim, Brother Tim introduced this concept for us a little while back, and I felt that God dropped it in my spirit as he was speaking to me about this message today. And, and I, ha- I even had to, I had to call, call him and say, or call him in the office. I was like, I have a question. What did you say about halt? Because the whole hungry, angry, lonely, tired, I said, what was it that, that, that you, you said about that? Because these are some of the places. I'll get to that in a second. <clears throat> He told me this. He said, you are most likely, and if I say it wrong, let me know. You are most likely to lose self-control at certain mindsets or certain times in your life. And it's halt. Hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. Now, and I understand what he was talking about. And and, and I, I believe it's true and I don't doubt it at all. Because I feel like this is what God, God told me. He said, look around the church and tell me about where people are at. Now, I believe that, let's, let's put a spiritual significance on this. Spiritually, I believe that there is a lot of hunger in this church. I believe that there's a lot of hunger in our city and in our region. I believe there is a ton of of hunger. Hunger can cause people to lose self-control. This is, and, and Brother Tim brought this up today, he said this is where we get the, the, the ha of being hangry. Does anybody here battle with being hangry? I do. I, 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 I get hangry. I don't get belligerent. I'm not rude to the waitress. or uh, No, that's not how I am. But I do get like, mm, I get perturbed. Because of food. (laughs) I get hangry. Hungry, angry, lonely, or tired. On the spiritual side of this, I believe that sometimes... This is where we need to be, to where we stop controlling things around us. We stop trying to control ourselves. We stop trying to control our our, our own situations. We stop trying to control our circumstances that we're in. When, When these things happen... You get hungry for God. There comes a time. There comes a time when a child begins to eat food that they previously didn't like because now they're hungry enough. I remember being young. I don't know how young. Time is, my wife would say, irrelevant to me. I have a rough time. But I'd say probably around the the age of 8 to 10, somewhere in there. My mom had to let me go with another family in the church, and we went swimming. And I swam for hours. And we came home, and on my way home, I was like, I am so hungry. And I said, dear God, please, of all things, please do not let my mom have made spaghetti. Did not like spaghetti. Hated spaghetti. 
walked in the house and dinner was ready, spaghetti. From that day on, I ate spaghetti. Why? Because rather than trying to suck my thumb and throw a temper tantrum, I just said, nope, I'm letting go of my self-control and I'm eating spaghetti because I was hungry. I learned to like a new food because I was hungry. You can also lose control because of anger. Your anger about your situation, your anger about how you always find yourself back in a bad place, back in a bad spot in your life, back to a faithless place, back to a place where your attendance is is atrocious, back to where you can't even, you can't even hear the voice of God because of all the other voices that, that, that you're allowing in. And you can get angry with your situation enough to where you say, okay, God, I'm done trying to control everything myself. I'm ready to let all that self-control go and get what I need from you. Loneliness. My God, I know some people here know about loneliness. You could be here today in the middle of this church full of people that absolutely love you who want what's best for your life, and you can sit here and think that you're completely alone in the world. I've been there. I've sat on platforms, meaning already in ministry, feeling, why am I here? I'm completely shut off from everything else and everybody else. I I allowed my loneliness, that hunger that I had to not be lonely, To break down my own self-control and say, God, I need you. God, I need you. Tired. Anybody been tired in the last few months? Anybody not lived perpetually tired in the last few months? If so, you got to tell me the secret. I've been perpetual. I can sleep. I look at my machine, it says 6.1, 6.6, 7.2, 0.3, 8.2. It does not matter. I wake up, and within an hour, I'm like, oh, I could use a nap. What's my problem? Sometimes God allows some of these things. Why? So we'll let our self-control go. But why? Why would he want us in a place like that? Because no matter whether it's hunger, anger, loneliness, or just being tired. We've seen and been in these very things lately. Could it be that God has this much confidence in us? To allow us into these situations to get our attention. Because He knows that that though me being tired, it, 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 it might last for eight years. Sister Tracy being tired, it might last two days, and she's already, okay, God, what's going on? It, me, it might take a lot longer. You might take a lot longer. But God will use these things to get our attention. Why? Because he wants to break us from thinking that we control these things. When all these things, see, Adult class today, God God knows the way. God God knows the God is the way, okay? God is the way. Period. He said, I am the the truth and the life. He is the way. He is the way. But I believe that God has much more confidence in us, confidence in us than we have in ourselves. My question and my my KJV version of the question, I verily believe the question is of God today. What are you willing to do? 
What are you willing to do? And, 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 and I want you to, to uh, this isn't something that I'm just throwing out that, oh, yeah, I'm willing to, okay, whatever. Okay, I'll come down and I'll pray. No, no, what are you willing to do? Where are you at? Because what you're willing to do is going to be based upon where you're at. Maybe you don't have all these life experiences. Maybe you haven't walked with Jesus for, for a while. And so when he says, come, you know what it feels like to be drawn of the Lord. And you know, you know that if God bids you to come, then he absolutely has a plan for you to succeed. Maybe you don't, maybe you don't have that experience. So if you don't have those, that level of experience that, that Peter had, if you don't have the years and years and years of experience of, say, Grandma, if you don't have her level of experience, may, maybe, maybe you're a Gideon. Maybe you understand him because you, you remember some stories in Sunday school or you understand him because you've read through some, some things in the Bible or you've been around while some people have taught Bible studies or, 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 or taught or preached or, or maybe you've been around a little while. But see, where are you at? Because whether it be getting out of the boat or fleecing God, there's always something we can do. Because today, and I feel in the Holy Ghost today, that the, the, the title of this message is Your Next Step. What is your next step? Not the next step. What is your next step? Your next step might look different than mine. Your next step might look different than Brother Isaiah's. Your next step might look different than Brother Nick's. What is your next step? I, I don't know what my next step is. Do you have the experiences? Do you need God to prove it? No, Brother Trent, you don't need God to prove it. I'll tell you like he's told me for years. All right, God, if you're real, do this. A week goes by. He don't even talk to me. Two weeks go by. He don't even mention nothing. I see nothing. And I'm like, God, what's going on? He said, you knew I was real. You didn't need this. Don't try to fleece me if your faith is already beyond that. Don't go back and say, if you're real, I'm going to stand here until that light flickers three times and then somebody's going to knock on the door. God's in heaven and all around, but he's in heaven going, you know you just prayed that to me, right? If I'm real, if I'm not, you look pretty stupid because you're talking to nothing. God, if you're real, some people need that, and some people don't. What do you need? God knows. You may not. Maybe you don't know what you need. So what do you think your next step is? God, I don't know what I need. I don't, God, I, maybe, maybe you just need some honesty. I don't know. God, if you'll show me what my purpose is, I've already showed you your purpose. You just don't think you can do it. Well, then I need what it takes to do it. Now we're talking. Now we're talking. Now we're talking. Because see, there's some things that not even every devil in hell can keep you from. I am legion. You're legion? Why are you at my feet, legion? Because this body is more powerful than me. The devil just doesn't want... Who cares? Anybody ever pull up to a red light and it seems like the person behind you wishes they were in front? They should have been first in line then. Some things just doesn't, it, they don't matter. The devil doesn't like it when I, if the devil doesn't like it, he could sit on attack. Ouch. Y'all don't sing that in Sunday school anymore? Come on, these are the classics. Our, our kids should be loving this. 
if the devil doesn't like it, he could sit on attack. Sit on attack to stay. I don't care what the devil wants. I don't care what the devil likes. Get the devil out of your vision. Get the devil out of your ears. This includes music. It took me a while to, to agree with this because I thought it was pretty good and I was angry that I didn't get it. But I heard somebody preaching years ago and he said, you know, when, when we begin to worship and we begin to praise God, what do we do? We're in church together. What do we do? Clap our hands. Tap our feet. Kind of do a little bit of jig. Kind of sway like a tree. Right? Anybody ever listen to any type of music that, like, makes you, you just, they makes you move in the body? I, I, I even listen to like Brother Byron Hippolyte, who is Holy Ghost filled rapper. And even when I'm listening to him, I'll look around like, 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 like Peter going to walk on water again. I'll look around and make sure nobody's there, and I'll start getting with it. I'll be like, I've been just resuscitated and filled with the Spirit. Can't get a little here, Sessa, make the devil fear it. We did here. I've been just resuscitated. Now I'm alive and made new. Don't do the things I used to do. I've been so free by the truth. I do, I do, I do that, right? Secular music makes you do the same thing, right? You know, just as much as this on a Sunday is worship to Jesus, that's a worship to their author. I don't know if this is on. Is this on? That's a little bit of meddling. Just, just a little bit. So our next step is going to look different to everyone. But for each and every one of us, this is true. We must allow the miraculous and the power of God to affect our structure, to affect our mind. Your structure has to do with your mind, the way you think, the way you, you conceptualize, the way you comprehend things that happen around you. How can you go through this and I only go through this, yet you can stand and I lay? I quit. I suck my thumb. Let's work on our structure. We're going through things. Why? Because God wants to strengthen our structure. He wants to strengthen who we are. He wants to strengthen our, our spirit, our heart, our mind. Will you allow God to change your mind? Honestly, it's probably one of the biggest questions you could ever ask anybody. Will you allow God to change your mind? Your mind, that's your soul. That's your spirit. Not spirit of God, that's your spirit. That's who you are. It's what you are. Will you allow God in to change that? We can come into a miraculous service. We can see the miracles of God. We can even experience miracles of God. But you can weep and you can, you can boo-hoo. You can snot all over the altar. You can have every prophetic word pro pro uh, prophesied over your life. Just... You, can, you literally can hear every prophecy you've ever heard in your entire life in one service. It can absolutely break you, and you can get up and say, that's all fantastic, but I'm going to go out here, and I'm not going to change. What you have done is you have relegated the power of God to simple emotion. This is why emotionalism is so dangerous. Not that we cannot learn to use emotions, but we just cannot Live by them. We cannot live by them. Our next steps will all look different. 
your soul, your spirit. What do you need? Some Bible study. Study the word of God. What do you need? A little more faithfulness. Faithfulness to God, the word of God, communication with God, showing up to the house of God. God knows. Well, I, I go to this church and that church and the other church, and there's 17 churches I go to, so I'm good. So who's the voice? Who's the voice in your life? I don't need a man. I have God. Well, then you don't have scripture either. What are you saying? I'm saying you need a pastor. There's going to have to be someone, and I'm going to try not to get on this. There's going to have to be someone one day that has to give account for you. And if you don't have anybody in your corner, nobody can give account for you. How can the judge judge righteously? Marriage is an institution of God, which is why there's something in that marriage that says, who giveth this woman to be with this man? There is a legal transaction that takes place of authority. Well, that's not it. Oh, that's exactly it. You just don't understand it. There's a pastor that has to give account for you. Pastor, tell me how they were to pastor. Huh, I don't know. Uh, uh, how do you not know? Your job was to be shepherd. How do you not know what it was like to pastor them? I saw them on Sunday. That's not a shepherd. That's barely a motivational speaker. Well, how can you say that? Because our example is Jesus. Jesus knows our name because we are his people and the sheep of his pasture. That's our example. What am I talking about? I'm talking about faithfulness, just being faithful to the house of God. I'm not saying I have to be your pastor, but Lord, have mercy, you need one. I know there's a lot of pastors out there. Fine. Make sure you have one. Faithfulness. You need unity and a desire to grow in God. I'm going to go back to where we began. And y'all can go ahead and stand up with me. Blessed is the man. Anybody here, and this is not a, 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 a sexist thing. This is blessed is the person. Anybody here want to be blessed? I mean, I do. I do. I want to be blessed. Blessed is the person, the man, that walketh not in the... What, what is counsel? People give an advice, right? I would advise you this. That's counsel. You get legal counsel. They give you their experiential advice based on their knowledge and their, their experience. Blessed is the man who walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. He threw that in there because you will be blessed if you will walk in the counsel of godly. Nor standeth in the way of sinners. These prepositional phrases, oh my goodness, they're, they're so important. Of the ungodly, of sinners, of the scornful. You will be blessed if you don't walk in the counsel of the ungodly, if you don't stand in the way of sinners or sit in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. His delight I wonder today if anyone will be honest enough to say that, Pastor, there have been times, and this might not be good, but there are times that the Word of God, huh, I didn't find it a delight. I, did, I, I didn't delight in the law of the Lord. I was skeptical. 
I was defensive. I've been there. I've been there. How can I expect my life to be blessed if I'm not delighting in His Word? See, in His Word are the words of life. Not death, but life. I'm talking about somebody's next step. And in His law doth He meditate day and night. He shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth His fruit in His season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. The ungodly, however, are not so. The ungodly are not so. They're not like that. But are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. What is your next step? If you already know your next step, if you already know what you need to do, then I invite you to come and make that commitment. I invite you to this front. If you don't yet know what your next step is, I invite you to come and seek. Because if you seek, you will find you ask you'll have it knock it'll be open to you if you're seeking for that next step no matter where we're at no matter where we are No, my life is complete. No. (laughs) No. It's not. It's not or God wouldn't be drawing you today. Lord Jesus, there are some men and women here. And some young men and young women. Some know the next step. Most don't. But God, every one of us today wants to take it. We want to take that next step today, Lord. That next step in you. That next step for you. The next step toward you, Jesus. We need, we desire to be one with you. God, I pray that you would answer the heart, the heart's cry today in Jesus' name. Jesus' name. Come on, it's all right. Go ahead and pray. You want to pray with someone? That's fine. This is very individual. 
you pray for you and then pray for themselves. Pray as a whole. Now isn't the time to take a, a dominion and authority over someone else. God's drawing each and every one of us today. Maybe somebody just needs to hear that you're praying as well. Whether you're hungry today, whether you've been angry, lonely, or tired. Maybe you're tired of not having the answers that you need. Maybe you're lonely, and what you're lonely for is God. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we open our hearts and our spirits, our minds, our lives to you, God. Oh, I withhold nothing right now, Lord. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Shatalabara bokondo sotararabahai. Shalalamandoro bokoria shatalarabasandahai. 